Hello, I'm Dr. Jacob Hudis. Welcome to a presentation on the Helium-3, Helium-4 Dilution Refrigerator, Methods in Ultra-Low Temperature Physics. Here's a brief overview of the presentation. Dilution refrigerators are the most advanced cooling devices ever created. They can cool to temperatures as low as 2 millikelvin. That's 0.002 Kelvin above absolute zero. These refrigerators are widely used in various physics and scientific experiments, especially in the context of superconducting electronics. Some examples are quantum computers, specifically superconducting quantum computers, squids or superconducting quantum interference devices, superconducting nanowire single photon devices, and other such superconducting electronics. The presentation will provide a clear, concise explanation of the science behind this incredible technology. The focus will be on the essential physics concepts that enable the functionality of the dilution refrigerator. To begin, I want to remind you about two helium isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4. This is a cartoon of helium-3. It has two electrons, and then it has one neutron and two protons. Helium-4 has two neutrons, two protons, and two electrons. So the difference is helium-3 has one less neutron in the nucleus than helium-4. Helium-3 is extremely rare, constituting about 0.000137% of helium on Earth. The price of helium-3 is roughly $3,000 per liter. If you were to buy a two-liter bottle of helium-3, it would be $6,000, although with inflation in the last few years, it's probably a lot more than that. Helium-4 is common. It's the most common helium isotope, and it makes up about 99.9998% of helium on Earth. It's not very expensive. In fact, they put it in children's balloons all the time. This slide discusses the zero-point energy of helium. The zero-point energy is the lowest possible energy that a quantum mechanical system can have. Unlike classical mechanics, quantum systems constantly fluctuate even at their lowest energy state. They cannot have zero energy. Here's an important equation derived from the simple model of a particle in a 3D box. This equation gives an approximation of the energy levels for a particle in a 3D box based on the quantum numbers nx, ny, nz. The constant out in front is what we call the zero point energy. Here's the constant and here's the zero point energy h bar squared over 8ma squared. H is Planck's constant, M is the mass of the particle, A is the characteristic length scale of the system, representing the distance between helium atoms. The zero-point energy goes as 1 over M. Due to their small atomic masses, both helium isotopes have large quantum mechanical zero-point energy. The zero-point energy is inversely proportional to the mass of the particle. For helium, this means the zero-point energy is quite significant. This circle represents the volume of the helium atom. Now, the helium atom is much smaller than the volume it occupies, but the helium atom is vibrating back and forth with some amplitude, and so the helium atom is going to occupy this volume even at zero temperature. If you remove all the energy from the helium atom, you can't remove all the energy. It's left with some energy, and that energy causes it to vibrate and occupy some volume. A is the characteristic length of that volume, and A would be the diameter of this circle. I also want to discuss the binding force between helium atoms. The binding forces between helium atoms are very weak. These are known as van der Waals forces. Both isotopes, helium-3 and helium-4, have identical van der Waals forces. If you want to know more about this formula, I go through it in detail in another video I made, Quantum Mechanics Made Easy, The Origin of the Schrodinger Equation, and Particle in a Box. I'll put a link to this video in the description as well as at the end of the video. This is the formula for the zero-point energy on the previous slide. I can solve this for A, the characteristic length goes as 1 over the square root of m. The importance of the zero-point energy in the dilution refrigerator lies in the fact that helium-3 has a larger vibrational radius than helium-4. That's because helium-3 has a smaller mass than helium-4. Since the dipole interaction depends on the distance, 1 over r cubed, liquid helium-4 is bound more strongly than liquid helium-3 at the same temperature. This results in helium-3 having a lower boiling temperature, smaller density, smaller latent heat evaporation, and larger vapor pressure for a given temperature. Helium-3 is actually physically smaller than helium-4. Helium-3 has one less neutron in the nucleus. This is the reason it has a larger zero-point vibrational amplitude, meaning it occupies a larger effective space. Another way to look at this is according to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, we cannot know the velocity exactly, so a particle cannot have zero velocity. This picture here shows helium-4 atoms, and you can see that the helium-4 atoms are closer together than the helium-3 atoms because the helium-4 atoms have a smaller vibrational amplitude. The center-to-center -center distance of helium-4 is smaller than the center-to-center -center distance of helium-3. Helium-4 is bound more tightly than helium-3. 
at the same temperature. Let's discuss the boiling and melting points of elements. Oxygen at zero Kelvin, it would be a solid, it would be solid oxygen. And as I increase the temperature, it stays solid until I get to 54 Kelvin. Once you get to 54 Kelvin, there's a phase change and it changes from solid to liquid. And then if I keep increasing the temperature and get to 90 Kelvin, it changes from liquid to gas. Liquid nitrogen is solid at 63 Kelvin and below. It's liquid between 77 Kelvin and 63 Kelvin, and it's a gas phase above 77 Kelvin. These are all at one atmosphere of pressure. You can see the values of liquid neon, liquid hydrogen, and here we have liquid helium. At one atmosphere of pressure, helium-4 is a liquid between 4.2 Kelvin. At this pressure, it's never a solid. Above 4.2 Kelvin, it changes from a liquid to a gas. At one atmosphere of pressure, helium-3 liquefies at 3.2 Kelvin, and it stays a liquid all the way down to zero Kelvin. Above 3.2 Kelvin, it changes from a liquid to a gas. Do you know why the boiling point for helium-3 is smaller than the boiling point for helium-4? That's correct. It's because it has a smaller mass and a larger vibrational amplitude. Good job. This slide is the reason that helium-3 and helium-4 are our cryogenic liquids of choice. They're inert, they have the lowest boiling points, and no melting points. If you want to cool something down, you use liquid helium. That's the reason scientists use helium in their dilution refrigerators. On this slide, I want to discuss the phase diagram for water as well as for helium-4. Here's the phase diagram for water. The y-axis is the pressure and the x-axis is the temperature. Let's look at a pressure of one atmosphere. One atmosphere at zero Kelvin, the water is solid. This is also known as ice. It's still in the solid ice phase up until you get to the temperature of 273 Kelvin. At this point, there's a phase change. You have to add an extra energy. It does not change the temperature at that point, but it changes phase. And now we've moved from ice to liquid water. If you keep increasing the temperature, you remain in the liquid water phase up until you get to about 373 Kelvin. It would start boiling, and then the water changes from liquid into vapor, which is also known as steam. And so this is what is known as the phase diagram for water. And a very important point is when you change phases from solid to liquid or from liquid to gas, you have to add an extra energy, which does not change the temperature, but that's the latent heat and it just goes into changing the phase. Here's an example of the phase diagram of helium-4. Let's look at an example of one megapascal of pressure. At zero temperature, you're in a superfluid phase. The superfluid phase is a phase of matter that doesn't exist for water. If you keep increasing the temperature, you stay within the superfluid phase until you get to roughly 2 Kelvin, and then there's a phase change. And once again, when there's a phase change, you have to add in extra heat, and the phase changes from superfluid into a normal liquid. And if you keep increasing the temperature, eventually you'll get into a gas of helium. To understand cooling by dilution, it's helpful to first explain evaporative cooling or cooling by phase change, using ice as an example. Ice can be used to cool a sample to zero degrees Celsius, which is 273.15 Kelvin. The key concept is it takes energy to change the phase from solid ice to liquid water. This energy is known as the latent heat of fusion. When a sample hotter than ice is placed in contact with ice, heat is transferred from the sample to the ice. The sample cools down, but the ice does not heat up. The heat causes the ice to melt, rather than increasing its temperature. The ice absorbs the heat energy and changes phase, while the temperature of the ice remains constant at zero Celsius during the process. As the ice melts, less ice is available to absorb the additional heat. The process cools the sample by using the energy to change the phase instead of heating the ice. The fundamental formula for cooling power is Q dot is equal to M dot times L. Q dot is dQ dt, M dot is dM dt, L is the latent heat of fusion. Q dot tells how much heat is leaving the sample per time. The sample is cooling down and it's cooling down because every second is losing heat. As time increases, the mass of the ice decreases and the mass of the ice is changing with time and that's M dot. Evaporative cooling with ice works because the phase change from solid to liquid absorbs heat from the sample. On this slide, I wanna discuss scientific refrigerators that use only helium-4 to cool sample. These refrigerators can achieve a base temperature of 1.3 Kelvin. The refrigerators operate similar to how touching a sample to ice cools it through evaporative cooling. There's an outer jacket of liquid helium-4, and this is at 4.2 Kelvin, the temperature of liquid helium at one atmosphere of pressure. This helps to prevent heat loss. Inside the jacket is a small bath of helium-4 equipped with a pump. Imagine you have a hot cup of tea and you blow on it to cool it down. A similar principle applies to liquid helium-4. 
When a pump is attached, the hottest helium-4 atoms are expelled, leaving behind a colder liquid. This process enables scientists to reach a base temperature of 1.3 Kelvin. Pumping technology limits cooling to temperatures above 1.3 Kelvin when using solely helium-4. Imagine there's a sample and we want to cool it to 1.3 Kelvin. To do that, we place it in contact with the 1.3 Kelvin helium bath and allow the helium to evaporate. The sample transfers heat to the liquid helium-4, which then changes phase from liquid to gas, absorbing the heat. This process is known as evaporative cooling with liquid helium-4. Cooling by evaporation of helium-4 liquid can only reach about 1.3 Kelvin. It is possible to overcome this limitation using a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. That's what a dilution refrigerator is, and that's what I'll be discussing on the next two slides. Next, let's talk about the phase diagram for a mixture of both helium-3 and helium-4. Imagine there's a container with both helium-3 and helium-4 isotopes. This picture shows these isotopes in gas phase. You can think of this as a container, and inside the container, there is both helium-3 as well as helium-4 isotopes, and this would be in a gas phase, so these are all bouncing around, they're hitting, they're bouncing off the walls, they're bouncing into each other. These isotopes are moving all over the container, but they're confined within the container. Note that in the gas phase, both helium-3 and helium-4 are the same size. The size difference only becomes relevant when they're in the liquid state confined to a quantum mechanical box. In this picture, helium-3 is drawn larger than helium-4. To emphasize, this is a mixture of two isotopes of helium contained within this box. We can assume that this is a gas, but if we start removing heat from it and cooling off this container, eventually this will change from a gas to a liquid. Imagine that we start cooling off this container and we remove heat from it, and eventually it will get to 2 Kelvin. Once it gets to temperature 2 Kelvin, it will be at this location on the phase diagram, and this is a phase diagram for the mixture of helium-3 and helium-4. Let's discuss this phase diagram, what it means, and how you interpret it. This phase diagram is different than typical phase diagrams because the y-axis represents temperature, and the x-axis represents the percent of helium-3 within the container. So imagine somebody takes a container and they put into that container 23% helium-3 and 77% helium-4 and then they seal it. If you take the container and you cool it down to 2 Kelvin, that container is gonna be at this location. This location tells you it's 2 Kelvin and if you follow all the way down this way, that tells you that it's 23% helium-3. That's what the x-axis means. At that point, the mixture is a normal liquid. The helium-3 sits on top of the helium-4 because it's lighter, similar to how oil floats on water. And it was always surprising to me that oil, which looks thick, is actually lighter than water. Can anyone explain in the comments section why oil, which looks thick and has a large viscosity, is actually lighter than water? As you cool the mixture further, you reach a phase line where the liquid transitions from a normal liquid to a superfluid for helium-4 and a Fermi liquid for helium-3. Despite these quantum phase changes, the helium-3 still sits on top of the helium-4. In this region, if you were to look inside the container, you would still see helium-4 on bottom and helium-3 on top. Now let's imagine we keep removing heat from the container. Eventually, we're going to get to another phase boundary. Once you get to this phase boundary, the helium-3 from the top layer diffuses into the helium-4. And this results in two phases, a concentrated phase of helium-3 on top and a dilute phase of helium-3 on bottom. The concentrated phase is nearly 100% helium-3. Above the boundary, you have 100% helium-4 on bottom and 100% helium-3 sitting on top. Once you pass this boundary, the top is still liquid helium-3, but now the bottom is a mixture of 23% helium-3 and 77% helium-4. In this slide, I'll focus on how to read the phase diagram and what it means. I'm not explaining the reason for the phase separation now. I'll discuss that briefly in upcoming slides, and if I get enough support, I'll make another video delving into those advanced physics concepts in detail. Please like and subscribe to my channel. If you start at point B, it means the initial concentration of helium-3 in the mixture is higher. Moving horizontally in the diagram, represents changing the concentration of helium-3 and helium-4 in the mixture. A key point is that the concentration of helium-3 in the dilute phase never drops below 6.6%, no matter how cold the mixture gets. If you're using a mixture of helium-3 and helium-4, the concentration of the dilute phase stabilizes at 6.6% regardless of how low the temperature is. This is why cooling by dilution can achieve a lower temperature than using pure helium-4. This slide explains the concept behind how a dilution refrigerator works. Assume we have a mixing chamber 
At 0.1 Kelvin, if a sample hotter than 0.1 Kelvin is placed in contact with the chamber, heat will transfer from the sample to the helium. This is a mixing chamber. We have a concentrated phase of nearly pure helium-3 sitting on top of a dilute phase of mostly helium-4 with 6.6% helium-3. And let's assume that this is at 0.1 Kelvin. If a sample hotter than 0.1 Kelvin is placed in contact with the chamber, heat will transfer from the sample to the helium. Heat is removed from the sample and it goes into the small helium bath. The heat causes helium-3 atoms to change from a concentrated phase to a dilute phase without changing the helium's temperature. This is the whole point. Up here, there's helium-3, and this helium-3 is in one phase, and that's the concentrated phase of helium-3. If the helium moves from the top to the bottom, the helium-3 makes a phase change, just like the phase change from water to ice. It takes energy to change the phase of the helium-3. That energy does not go into changing the temperature, but it goes into changing the phase of the helium-3 as the helium-3 goes from the concentrated phase to the dilute phase. It's the same principle as using ice to cool something, where the ice changes from solid to liquid, and the latent heat is what's used as the cooling mechanism. Here, the helium changes phase, but it's going from this concentrated phase to the dilute phase. It is a little weird that this, this is the incredible concept of the dilution refrigerator. We've covered the main material I wanted to get through in this presentation. In the next few slides, I'll briefly cover some advanced concepts and engineering principles of how a dilution refrigerator works. If you'd like a full presentation on this topic, please like, subscribe, and leave a comment requesting the next video. Helium-3 is a smaller vapor pressure than helium-4 because of the mass difference. This allows us to pull helium-3 atoms out of the dilute phase as hot helium-3 transitions from the concentrated to the dilute phase. The sample touches this mixing chamber, heat leaves the sample, the sample causes helium-3 to move from the concentrated phase to dilute phase, and because of this difference in vapor pressure, there's a way to pump out helium-3 from the dilute phase and bring it back and circulate it. This is the way we can continually keep a small sample at these very low temperatures. And finally, I want to briefly explain the helium-3, helium-4 mixing. This is a complicated topic. Why is it? that the helium goes from the concentrated phase to the loot phase. Van der Waal forces between helium-3 and helium-4 are the same, but helium-3 has a larger zero-point motion due to its smaller mass. In the liquid phase, helium-4 atoms occupy a smaller volume than helium-3 atoms. Helium-3 atoms prefer to be in the helium-4 liquid due to stronger binding from closer distance. The Fermi temperature of the liquid helium-3 is about 1 Kelvin. Helium-3 atoms obey the Pauli exclusion principle and fill energy states up to the, up to the Fermi level. Helium-3 atoms stop evaporating from the concentrated to dilute phase once the chemical potential of both phases is equal, which is 6.6% concentration at T equals zero Kelvin. These are the ideas that I can put together in another presentation if that's something you're interested in seeing. These ideas are based on the fact that helium-3 is a fermion and helium-4 is a boson. This is because helium-4 has four spin one-half nucleons and helium-3 has three spin one-half nucleons. So helium-3 is a fermion and helium-4 is a boson. AcePhysics.org Math and Physics Tutoring with Dr. H AcePhysics.org Math and Physics Tutoring with Dr. Hudis.